We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. I mean, come on, no one plans to get sick. And yet, here we are. My name is Matthew Zachary. I survived cancer, a stroke, and COVID 19, and I'm still here. I also survived our broken healthcare system. And I want to help you survive it too. So let's go make healthcare suck less together because we're all out of patience. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the program. A quick reminder before we get started if you like the show, and I hope you do, and you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please consider leaving me a rating and review. I got a frail ego. I need your validations, you know, or, or don't. Either way, let's see what happens. Back on the show today, Michael Millinson is a health policy strategist, consultant, legacy agitator of the status quo, and president of Health Quality Advisors. Man, I was happy to just sit back and play armchair expert as we attempted to deconstruct and schoolhouse rock what exactly healthcare reform actually means with a new administration, perhaps a more... I don't know, cockeyed pessimist view on advancing the ball. Could there be even the slightest chance that healthcare could suck less sooner than later? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Enjoy the show. We should do a whole show saying the problem with our healthcare system is we're not spending enough money. Sure, we're 18% of the GDP, but really, couldn't we be 25% or, or, or even more? And with that, the segment begins. Michael Millison back here and out of patience with kind of a, a rant. We want to talk about healthcare reform now, which I don't know. Those are four words that just sound like a Simpsons storm the castle kind of thing. Actually, bad metaphor for these days. But, you know, the the pitchforks when they go to Mayor Quimby, healthcare reform now. When do we want it? Uh, now? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's always the season for health care reform. And it's both uh, uh, e even more prominent now, of course, with President Biden and a new administration. Yeah, I was going to say that as we're taping this in February of 2021. Yes, Biden has taken office. There is a new HHS philosophy happening, different opposite versions of what was what not kind of all that stuff. So health care reform, first of all, We'll get to what the hell that means, at least from your definition, is once again at the top of the national agenda. <laughs> For those who've heard Michael on my show in the past, you know, he's a card carrying healthcare wonk, but he's also like the perfectly loquacious, angry guy. He's unapologetically calling out shit longer than I have. So I take lots of cues from what he's put up there. All right, what the hell does healthcare reform mean? Because we've been vomiting that out into a cloud yelling for 30 years? Well, first of all, I want to tell you that I'm both all in favor of reform and, and I think it's a terrible idea. <laughs> I, I, I want to be on the record. And, and so the thing is, is that when you look at healthcare reform, you have to look at the fine print, right? So to me, healthcare reform is like those website privacy notices where you click, I agree, and, and, you, and, and you can't really read all that fine print that goes on for 50 pages. And what it really says is they can sell your private information to anyone not currently residing in a federal penitentiary, as well as active duty members of the Chinese and Russian military. And uh, the fine print uh, in healthcare reform and everything else will get you every time, Matt. So it's like the iTunes terms of service that you kind of just, sure, okay, click. What, am I not going to use Apple Music? Of course. Exactly. So when everybody talks about healthcare reform, you have to ask a few questions. So he here's one 
healthcare reform idea that sounds really positive, right? Do you think, and it's in your own experience, of course, do you think that patients should have the power to control their own medical care? So this goes back to our previous conversations that I've been talking about with you and, on, and other guests here on the show is, you know, I, I tend to think about it as consumers. You happen to be in the healthcare uh, demand market, right? So you happen to be someone in need of consumption of products and services to ideally save your life. The antithetical part is you didn't ask to be there. When you go to Zillow, you're going to buy a house probably, but you want Zillow to help you find that house. You get into the healthcare system and then you become a patient and yet you're an American citizen. Should you have the power to control that? One might assume but I, I go back to like Dave DeBroncart, channeling Dave DeBroncart years ago. He's like, patients should have their own data. And this was like back when hard drives existed. And he's like, can you imagine touting around an eight terabyte hard drive with you and say, here, doc, here's my hard drive. Take your crap. Who's going to want that? So so let me let me go to the, to the American citizen thing for one moment and then uh, talk about health care reform for consumers. In the beginning of the 20th century, a doctor treating a woman from Chicago who had epilepsy took out her ovaries to treat her epilepsy and didn't inform her uh, what he was doing in the late 19th century. And um, she sued. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And what the doctor said was, listen, you're a patient and I was doing what was best for you. And if I told you what I was doing, you might have objected. And it's my duty as a doctor to do what's best for you. And the Supreme Court ruled that as an American citizen, your, your term, Matt, as a citizen, you do not give up your rights to have someone assault your body just because they're a doctor. And that took a ruling of the Supreme Court. That eventually gave us informed consent, which today means that your doctor can talk to you while you're lying flat on your back in a gurney, hand you a piece of paper that has 17 pages on it and say, uh, before we give you the anesthesia, would you like to consent? So, um, <laughs> yeah, good timing. <laughs> Great timing. Right, that's pretty much what informed consent. But thanks to the Supreme Court, you have the right to sign your name to a piece of paper as you lie flat on your back uh, with tubes coming out of your body. It's a great country. But there you go. That's reform. The where and when would have mattered in that decision. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the poor Supreme Court didn't think of that, uh, that the, the loophole. So if you're in favor of consumerism, then you want health care reform that gets government bureaucrats out of Medicare and gives you, the consumer, the power, nay, the freedom to select whatever private, for-profit Medicare health plan that you want. And by the way, when you do pick a plan, uh, I'd be careful about what illness you get in any month that doesn't have an R in it. That fine print again. I guess the, the broader question is, you know, that doesn't sound fascinating. You know, who, who doesn't love the health insurance industry said no one ever. At the end of the day, <laughs> what mechanisms, looking at the consumer side, from a consumer protection who is protecting the American consumer based on said potential freedom, right, liberty to guarantee that they're going to get what is best for them outside of the, you know, quote, bureaucratic self-interests of who's going to make a profit off you instead? Did I say that right? Yeah. So, so that's a big question. I would say that consumer protections in healthcare are pretty weak. If you're talking about health care plans that go to people who are of Medicare age, there's rules that say everybody has to charge the same amount of money. And then there's some other things, but at least there's some sort of federal regulation there that's relatively weak, but at least is consistent. When you go down to health insurance that's not there, that's sort of regular health insurance in the States, the state insurance agencies are, are very weak. Most of the people there spend their time dreaming of when they can leave and get a job with an insurance company. Uh, and then sort of you got the ones that are exempt under uh, ERISA laws and you, wait, know, what you is, hope that you- Wait, jargon alert. What's an ERISA law? ERISA law is a, I'm not going to get the abbreviation right, but in, back in 1974, they passed a law allowing companies to offer pension plans in a better way. And Healthcare wasn't mentioned in the law. And since then, every company with like over 500 employees has managed to become a 
self-insured company. Therefore, the health plan is not covered by state insurance laws. It's covered by this federal law that had nothing to do with health care. And uh, uh, they're all exempt from state regulation. And that's what most people, if you work for any company that's of any size, that's mostly what you're in. So by and large, and then we won't even get into doctors, which, you know, the state medical boards are toothless and all the rest of that. So essentially, when it comes to consumerism and healthcare, there is not much of a safety net. Uh, and if something goes wrong, you don't have very many people to complain to. And if you do, most of those people you complain to don't have much power. Right. Which which then takes us down like the Bernie Sanders rabbit hole of the government's role in protecting its citizens is that a least worst situation than private sector interest because, you know, the magic word of socialism. And yet we talk about the VA. That's socialist. The government takes care of our veterans. Talk about, you know, firefighters and police and how our government taxes pay for these services. You know, wherein lies the argument for and against, you know, everyone's hashtagging Medicare for all. I don't think it's a good idea. I think this should be something balanced, like what kind of works in Australia. You can kind of Google how their system works. It's nice and hybrid. But this idea of every, you get a car and you get a car and you get a car, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, actually, you know, you know, you know, the, uh, the Clinton administration came out with a health care reform plan that was a private public mix called managed competition back in the early 1990s. And it was based on conservative economists and uh, it was actually adopted by Israel. Uh, uh, back then, Israel, uh, before being infected by the coronavirus, they were infected by the Milton Friedman virus, uh, which causes people to believe in uh, capitalistic economics, uh, which uh, up until then had not infected the country as much as it has now. And so they have a system of uh, competing health plans, which uh, everybody is covered through the government gives everybody, uh, you know, health insurance, but different health plans compete and you can buy extra coverage and all the rest of that kind of thing. And um, frankly, th the problem with Medicare for all, which is a great slogan, is that while doctors and hospitals will, in fact, save a bundle of money on administrative overhead and paperwork costs, what they don't say is the government also pays a lot less than private insurers. And so the average hospital's revenue would plunge 35%. And that's even before we start talking about COVID. Uh, and, you know, you take away that kind of money, and not to mention throwing all those people out of uh, jobs in, in private insurance companies. And don't worry, over 10 years, we'll save money, which I'm sure is a lot of consolation. Uh, I don't think we have enough restaurants open anymore for all those doctors uh, uh, who watch their incomes plunge to get jobs as waiters and pay off their medical school debt. So um, is universal coverage a good idea? Absolutely. Does it have to be the way Bernie Sanders says it? No. We could do it the way they do it in Germany or Australia or Israel or many, many other countries. It doesn't have to be Canada. It doesn't have to be England. Uh, it can be the way any other industrialized democracy does it. That's a combination of public and, and private plans. Uh, and, and so in Israel, if you buy one of the one of the add-on insurance plans, for instance, you can get, I looked at this at one point, things like equestrian therapy. What? Like if you need to go horseback riding or something like that. And then because Israel is a small country, they also, a lot of these extra plans say, we will cover you if you go abroad for care. You know, uh, health care reform that honors the social contract and says all of us are vulnerable would be terrific. Unfortunately, we end up with a choice between today's screwed up system, as if it's so wonderful, and uh, socialism a la Bernie Sanders and uh, his uh, fellow travelers. Loaded question. Sure. Whose interest would it be for the American system to transform to the Israeli system? Oh, uh, it would be in the interest of the average American citizen. It might be in the interest of the health insurance industry to some extent, but not to the current extent, because what you'd end up with is a lot of companies going kaput um, and some of the less efficient ones going kaput, which they're not in the interest in. And of course, hospitals and doctors do not want a payment system where the government influence on how much they get paid is enormous. And the question that our country occasionally faces up to, 
every so often, is what is our obligation to our fellow citizen? What is our social contract? You know, what are we willing to do to make sure that the least among us have a certain minimum? And unfortunately, our religious establishment, which preaches uh, love thy neighbor, uh, has not ever made this something that the right wing and left wing come together with in the name of charity and religion and what Christianity and Judaism actually teach. And uh, we've had this sort of socialist uh, boogeyman. There's no question that going to something like the Israeli system or the German system would be disruptive, but people would be better off. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. For the last 18 years, my whole mission is really around the non-Medicare universe, the young right. adults or Gen Xers or younger Absolutely. boomers, because that changes the entire game when you're looking at you know 30 or 40% of the country that are getting their insurance from their employers. I mean, and COVID notwithstanding, of course, as we tape this, how does that manifest differently because you know, companies decide what their benefits plan is based on, you know, X magic algorithm. Right, right, right. So I was a benefit consultant for five years. And if you took the benefits consultants of this world and put their hand on a Bible and said, to what extent does each individual employer's benefit design really matter? Uh, I don't think that in many industries, yeah, is it different if you're working for uh, a high tech versus you're working for a department store? Sure. Right. But by industry, do we need all of this? And so what the Israeli system gives you, and I'm more familiar than that, I'm not as familiar with the German and Swiss system, although they have some of the same thing, is you have a basic minimum and then you have policies that add on to it, right, to all the bells and whistles you want, you know. Uh, and, and so you'd still be able to have your bells and whistles. Again, nobody is talking about Britain here or Canada. We're talking about a combined private public system where Everybody is entitled to a minimum. And then if other people want to add on, that's great. So, you know, we can we can cover all those extra bennies for uh, uh, the working population. You know, that's that's fine. But just give everybody a minimum. I mean, I know from experience working at Stupid Cancer, you look at the Silicon Valley industry and the early health tech startup industry. Most of the employees are in their 20s. So they want right. to create the benefits package that is largely catered towards a younger crowd, you know, fertility Absolutely. benefits and this, you know, time off and, you know, all the concierge service to never leave the campus because they get everything you want there. Absolutely. Because it's in their interest to burn these kids out by 30 by giving them everything they wanted in their 20s. But that is that's a limited echo chamber in the industry. Well, and it's one and it's one industry. How about the person in their twenties that uh, was just laid off from uh, working in a theater company, or somebody who was laid off from some other kind of marketing job, or other kinds of things? I mean, and, and then we have we have a poor safety net. So there should be a safety net for everyone, and then you can add on. I mean, one of the things you you raise an interesting point that I've I've actually been thinking a lot about lately, which doesn't come under healthcare reform when people talk about it as a governmental 
kind of a function, but does to me come under equity in a different kind of way. And that is that if you're working for the right company with the right benefits, you now can get fertility benefits. So that if you're trying to get pregnant, uh, they have companies that are expert in making sure that IVF, in, in vitro fertilization, works better, uh, is more attuned to your genomics and to your biology and all the rest of that. There are companies that look at cancer outcomes that are tailored to you, that are trying to say, what's the best therapy for you? And onwards and onwards. And so I wonder about the fact that people don't even understand that there's this lack of, of equity, that where you happen to choose to work can decide whether you have a kid, whether you recover from cancer, uh, what Medicare plan you choose if you're an older person can determine whether or not you get food delivered to your home, whether or not someone comes to visit you when you're lonely. And I'm all in favor of competition based on different kind of offerings to different people, but there's not a lot of transparency around that. Most people probably have no idea that this kind of discrepancy in benefits exists. They think of it as what, what, what you just said, Matt, right? Concierge, I get a little, you know, I don't have to leave the campus and we have an on-site medical clinic that, you know, uh, is, is, is state of the art. But some of these other kinds of benefits that are added on, some of these kind of fringes that are now very high tech and sophisticated, like I said, outcomes on cancer, uh, you know, biological data on your body to see whether you can get pregnant. I don't know. I'm not sure what to make of, of those kinds of, uh, of differences. No, and again, I, I would comment back that, you know, uh, getting a job is, is great. You're excited to get a job. And I think you know, the iTunes terms of service in your benefits package gets very easily <laughs> right. glazed over because you just That's want right. the job, right? No one, I, right. I I would love to hear from listeners who said, you know, I don't want this job because your benefits suck. It's like, no, I want this job because I'm 22 and want a job. So ab, 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 now, like I said, the only thing where that goes is right. If, if you're in, in really high demand and you're being wooed by a few companies and you say, well, this one, this one offers, you know, catered meals seven days, right? Or this one's healthcare is incredible. I mean, I think there are people who are in the fortunate position of being uh, catered to and in a lot of demand, but it would be interesting what percentage of people, particularly young people, are in the position where other companies are fighting over the right to hire them. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I've never had a lot of people who were fighting over the right to hire me, and and I was uh, pretty grateful when I got a job offer. But I'm saying, if you're privileged enough and experienced enough and deserve it enough to be fought over, you can then negotiate the terms with which you will take that job. If you're just in the market as a you know junior associate or whatever you're going to get what they give you because you're excited to just have the job, right? Well, by, by the way, speaking of fringe benefits, uh, you might have seen that this uh, uh, black woman became the first uh, uh, black woman to head up Walgreens, one yes. of the few to be in a photo, right? If you looked at her benefits, you know, she was being paid, I don't know, one and a half million a year plus a $3 million bonus. That's the other thing. But among her fringe benefits was she was entitled to 50 hours a year of personal use of the company airplane. And I'm thinking... Really, if you're paid a couple of million dollars a year, um, you know, if you want to use the corporate jet, maybe, I don't know, maybe that could come out of your own pocket or you could do it at cost. Yeah. But like, you know, uh, uh, 50 hours a week of personal use of the corporate jet. And that's good because that way you don't have to worry about scandals when you take your, uh, your family on a ski vacation. Uh, uh, nobody can say, well, that's misuse of the corporate jet. You, no, no. I have 50 hours. I took them on ski vacation. Then we went to a, uh, a concert. Uh, and then, you know, so, so really it, 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 it's a scandal preventing mechanism, I guess. All right. So let's, let's focus the rest of the conversation on uh, this is not a specific area of my expertise, but I know it's a dumpster fire rabbit hole that can open up Pandora's box within a hurricane as Zephyr deep fried in some kind of earthquake. So it is the idea that you cannot negotiate the price of drugs with the U.S. government because of the pharmaceutical lobby groups. Just unpack that. I, I'm not an expert. I don't know what that so, means. So um, for years... Medicare never covered drugs, right? Uh, never covered covered medications. They started off as a safety net. We're going to cover the hospital stays, which are incredibly expensive. Then we'll cover doctor's visits and eventually 
we should cover medications as well. There was one attempt to do that in Medicare, and it, it, it was a fiasco. Then eventually under the Bush administration, second Bush administration, they passed a Medicare drug benefit, which they call Part D as in David. And uh, because a lot of conservatives thought this was just more socialism, even if it was a Republican was proposing it, they kept the vote open for like an extra hour or three hours while they twisted the arm of one representative uh, who they needed to, to cast a vote for it so that it would actually pass, one of the Republicans who opposed it. And one of the provisions in that law was that the federal government Medicare cannot negotiate drug prices with the drug companies. And I remember talking to uh, a senior official in the, in the Bush administration. I said, look, I don't understand this. You guys are Republicans. You believe in capitalism. You believe in markets. How can you put in that you won't negotiate with the drug companies? And he proceeded to explain to me why this was not anti-competitive. It was actually pro-competitive. Of course, so pro-competitive that the drug companies insisted on it being in there. And, and, and the essence of his argument was, which speaking of rabbit holes was really down the rabbit hole for me, was that if the federal government negotiated prices, the government was so powerful that doing that would stifle innovation. Ah, that's the magic And word. one of the favorite chants of the pharmaceutical industry is how you need high prices for innovation. And, you know, I, I, I studied economics and there's a couple of things they don't tell you. So the first thing is, of course, you need a return on capital. Absolutely. And you have to be careful not to mess that up. But when they say that a new drug on average costs a billion, two billion, whatever, and look at the risk we're taking, what they never say, and I've asked about this, is, okay, great. On average, how long does it take to earn it back. Because if I told you I wanted you to invest $1,000 with me and you were going to get back your money in a year, two years, three years, five weeks, right? That makes a difference. So when you look at the risk, you're absolutely right. Tell us about the risk. Now, tell us about the reward. Dead silence. The second thing is that they don't like to talk about is flat of the curve. What does that mean? That means that if a drug costs ten dollars, uh, maybe you won't innovate because you're not making enough money. If it costs a thousand dollars, maybe the return is enough that you can take the risk of 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 not finding the kind of drug you want. And there's a lot of risk. Uh, cancer drugs in particular, but a lot of risk. Alzheimer's drugs haven't worked out. But if a drug costs a thousand dollars and that encourages you to innovate more than if it costs ten dollars. What about ten thousand dollars a dose? What about a hundred thousand dollars a dose? Right. And at some point, the amount of money you're paying for the drug does not lead to more innovation. It simply leads to more profit. That just goes to things like uh, uh, the corporate jet or really nice office buildings and really nice salaries. Right. So, yes, we have to be careful about not killing the golden goose, but stuffing the goose with more and more gold isn't the answer either. So, so going back to our uh, top of the conversation, healthcare reform, again, it just sounds like syllables with the jargon button happening there. Is there hope, optimism, aspiration, even potential to change, and I said just, you know, change in quotes with air quotes or whatever, uh, the government's capacity to negotiate drug prices that somehow algorithmically, economically does not stifle innovation? I would say that like much other healthcare reform, the answer to that is eventually, <laughs> uh, not in the near term, because the prohibition against uh, negotiation by Medicare is in law. It's in legislation. It's mm. not something you can reverse by executive order. And drug companies are headquartered in states that have powerful Democrats, like in New Jersey, New York, uh, as well as powerful Republicans. And so uh, it is not easy to reverse something that's in law by that. Now, some states are doing things and others are doing things. Uh, where we're going now, which is good, is rather than worrying so much about price, 
we're worrying about outcomes and value. So we're saying, okay, rather than saying this drug, arguing with you that this drug should cost 90,000 and not 100,000 or whatever, which we always lose, we're going to say, all right, we're going to buy this drug if you can prove that the people who take it uh, have outcomes that are so improved that it saves us so much money, right? And there are problems with those contracts. There's problems with how you calculate it and whether you're putting your thumb on the scale. I'm not trying to simplify and say that, you know, this is a panacea, but at least if we talk about value and what we're getting for the money as opposed to just the price, perhaps we'll have a more uh, productive uh, uh, discussion. And to be fair, the pharma companies can read public opinion and they know that just talking about price is a losing proposition for them eventually. And so they're willing to talk about value. And that's good. That's good that uh, people, for whatever reason, are moving towards a more rational way of pricing healthcare. So I don't want to sound totally pessimistic. There is a little blue sky of optimism that our healthcare system is moving towards value. And just, just to be uh, another slice of small optimism, right? So why is everybody moving towards, okay, we want to have value-based care as opposed to charge whatever we can in fee-for-service medicine, charge whatever we can for drugs, et cetera, is because all of them know that if we collapse the system because of greed, we're going to get true socialized medicine. We're going to get government controls. We're going to get price controls. Because if you screw around with the American public enough, what you'll see is ideology doesn't count when enough middle class people and others are getting hurt. And so to prevent the system from collapsing, as it were to go back not to kill the golden goose, uh, everybody is willing to have a little bit less gold so the whole thing doesn't collapse and, and bring about price controls. All right. On that note of cockeyed pessimism, uh, <laughs> I'll just note that, you know, here we are, uh, Michael Millison, one of the most grotesquely positively impatient and I say that with a, a degree of dad joke in there. I love having you here on the show. Michael Millison, consultant, researcher, activist, agitator of the status quo, president at Health Quality Advisors. Thanks for coming back on the program. My pleasure, Matt. That's all for today, folks. If you like today's show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Brianna Seeley, Jen Orange, and Andrew McDowell. It is mixed and edited by Brianna Seeley. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com.